It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everyone. Starring the imperturbable John Hersey and the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein. I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are, indubitably, John Hersey. How are you doing this morning, John? Excellent. How are you doing today, Andy? I'm doing great. It's a beautiful, sunny day in the New York suburbs. We got Thanksgiving rolling up uh, you know, in, in, in less than a week my all-time favorite holiday, and we have a special guest on this morning to discuss uh, someone who's who's merely the greatest scientist in history. Uh, So you want to introduce our our guest, John? Absolutely. We have the distinguished Lawrence Gould, professor of physics at the University of Hartford, on with us today to discuss Isaac Newton. So exciting. And there's a bit of an interesting biographical footnote that I think you wanted to ask him about. Yeah, oh, you're definitely right, John. And, you know, uh, Dr. Gould has a PhD in physics from uh, Temple University. So he, and like you said, he is a professor of physics at the University of Hartford. And so he's got a lot of, a lot of knowledge and experience in this field, qualified to uh, discuss the greatest scientist in history, uh, Sir Isaac Newton. But first, uh, we need to discuss a few minutes about another great mind, one that uh, Dr. Gould has personal contact with. None of us have any personal contact with Isaac Newton. But Larry, you were uh, were Professor M in Ayn Rand's epistemology, legendary epistemology workshops. Is is that right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, And uh, I'm in the section about induction. And and, uh, there's a couple of pages actually back and forth between uh, me and her. Uh, I met her earlier also at uh, NBI courses. In fact, uh, there's some question I pose, and uh, this before the lecture started, she wanted to chat with me. So um, she was sitting there in the middle of a bunch of empty chairs, and uh, then and we chatted a bit. Okay, and um, and then I I've, I've seen her and I've ch- chatted with her and other occasions and uh, I've got all sorts of autographs and books. And I think the reason that I was uh, permitted to be in the epistemology workshop is because at the time uh, I was at Brooklyn Polytech, who was called, and I was doing graduate work at night in physics and Leonard Peikoff was teaching in the philosophy department and uh, it was during the vietnam war and some of the students and faculty got the university shut down at least in part and uh, we that's peacock and uh, and others including me uh, created a group with the acronym stop s-t-o-p which stood for students to oppose the putsch at poly <laughs> And uh, we we got the we got the place reopened. Someone burned uh, part of the ROTC building, but that was it. So the, I think I think probably Peikoff communicated uh, with Rand and uh, the organizers, and so I was permitted to to sit in on the epistemology series. Some of it. So what, what, what year was this? What, Vietnam War. So this was in the nineteen sixties, Larry. The sixties. This was in the sixties. Yeah. So you were young, you were, you were, you were a young, young guy. Now, what was it like to be in, the, in, a, in, a, in a workshop with somebody you, you must have known at the time was one of the great minds uh, of history in, in the fields of, of literature and, and philosophy? Well, uh, I, I thought very much of her then, but I didn't understand the philosophy anywhere near as well as I did later on. Uh, but uh, she was uh, luminous and very precise as, uh, as usual in, in speaking, formulating her ideas. And um, we, did have some, we did have some disagreements. Um, uh, she was chatting with me uh, during the break about the uh, corruption of modern physics. Well, it depends on what you mean, you know. I, I, I had a, I didn't think that modern physics was corrupted. 
Um, uh, and so it's not clear to what extent, philosophically corrupt, because it's very successful. So I saw her disappointment, but uh, she was disappointed <laughs> that I wasn't uh, a believer that uh, modern physics was philosophically corrupt. Um, you know, if, there, if there's a tie between philosophy and uh, what goes on in the world, then uh, since physics is so successful, I, it couldn't be that corrupt. It may, it's, it could, it's corrupt in certain ways, but uh, uh, one had to have a longer conversation and we never got to that. So wow. that, that good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Larry. Uh, well, um, the, the, uh, I don't want to occupy too much of the of your show by talking about my experiences uh, because you probably want to hear more about Newton. Uh, but that's that's just some of the that's just some of the things. And uh, uh, I I was in I was living in New York at the time, and, uh, and then I went and I uh, did uh, graduate work at Temple University. So I moved to Philadelphia after that. Right, and that's where I, right. I finished well, my PhD. We un we understand. Well, John, we've heard something about one of of history's exalted minds. I'm sure you have some questions for La for Larry Gould on on one of the other exalted minds of history. I'm sure you do. Yeah, who's this guy Isaac Newton, and and what did he do? No, I, I kid. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Um, <laughs> Like some other great scientists, there are uh, stories about Newton, uh, a number of which are true and some of which are false. And uh, the problem these days is that um, the internet enables uh, a much faster propagation of both types, the true and the false. So I will tell you something of what I know, which I think is true based on my readings. And I put a few things together, and uh, I know that there's audio, there's a podcast uh, part of this, and so uh, I will describe whatever I hold up. There won't be too many things that I hold up. Uh, I can tell you about uh, when Newton lived. Um, so he was born in 1642. And uh, that was the same year that Galileo died. Now, if, if people like to groove on this kind of thing, you know, well, so Galileo passed on uh, the mantle of investigation to Newton. In a sense, he did, but not voluntarily. Okay, here's another one that uh, you, your listeners might find interesting. And that is uh, James Clark Maxwell, who is the creator of electromagnetic theory, um, famous equations, and uh, we owe enormous amount to Maxwell, uh, including the means by which uh, wireless works. Uh, so the communication from cell phone to cell phone, for example, is by electromagnetic uh, waves. Now, Maxwell died in 1879, and Einstein was born in 1879. So um, you can make something of that as well. There's the mystical way of making it. Well, he, there's a, some sort of uh, vibrations that get passed on. But I look at it more straightforward, namely that Maxwell's ideas were picked up by Einstein. In fact, they were, and very importantly uh, as well. So, uh, uh, getting back to Newton, then Newton. Well, uh, Larry, hold on a second. Can I, Larry? Yeah. Can I interject yeah. for just one second? Um, Please. Because it's, it's, in it, yeah, in intellectual history, you know, it, it's interesting because um, Galileo was born in, in 1564, right, which was the year Michelangelo died. And then he dies, like you said, in 1642, the year that Newton's born. So he's often thought of as a conduit between the Renaissance. I mean, Michelangelo's dead. The Renaissance is over, right? He's often thought of as yeah. a conduit between the Renaissance and, and, and the age of reason. Um, but yeah, I mean, epistemologically, you know, there's no, you're right, there's no mystical connection between these, these great minds. It's a historic coincidence. But it's an interesting historic coincidence. I mean, um, yeah. that, 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 sure. 
So, Indeed. but anyway, yeah, so the, there are a lot so, of so, uh, um, theories like this, right? About no, Newton, and in part, they they stem from him having somewhat of an odd personality. Some have speculated yeah. that he had Asperger's or was on the autism spectrum, and others have said that you know when he was exhumed, they found huge amounts of mercury uh, in his body and, or in his bones, indicating that yeah. he might have well, had mercury poisoning while doing experiments. Yeah, uh, he was many faceted. Okay, uh, Newton kind of had his foot in um, in the past and in the future in terms of. Uh, the the mystical aspects and uh in the future in the sense of uh great methodologies and investigations of science and and a brilliant mind able to do that uh his when he was uh after he was born in 1642 i say um on christmas day uh he was very frail okay and um one would think, well, such a frail person, uh, how long could he live? Uh, and it was made even more difficult because during his lifetime, there was what was called the maunder minimum, when the sunspot cycle was very low, the sun's activity was very low. Uh, it was very difficult uh, to farm because of the uh, colder weather. And in addition, uh, when Newton was at Cambridge uh, College, of, uh, the Trinity College of Cambridge University, the plague struck. Okay, so uh, how long did he live with there? Well, he actually died at the age of about eighty-four. He beat Einstein. Einstein died at seventy-five. Okay, but Einstein lived in more modern uh, times. Yeah, so. Uh, he and uh, Newton uh, uh, started out, uh, he, he was uh, living with his grandparents because his mother went off and married someone uh, because Newton's father died before Newton was born. But Newton had an interest in um, popular scientific book at the time when he was a child and he would perform certain experiments. And he was, it was reported that he would uh, put candles on kites and um, affright, as it said, or scare the local uh, populace. But then, uh, he uh, he went to uh, Cambridge. He was about 19 when he went to uh, Cambridge University, and uh, he was um, a student, I guess, of uh, Isaac Barrow. Isaac Barrow was um, interested in the divinity, but also a great geometer, and uh, Barrow held what is called the first Lucasian Chair of Mathematics at Trinity College in Cambridge. And uh, then Barrow decided he would leave uh, Trinity College and uh, go off. I think he might have gone to London, I'm not sure, uh, to continue his work on um, study and theology. And he recommended Isaac Newton to take his, uh, his chair. And so Newton was the second Lucasian professor of mathematics at Trinity College. Some other greats that held the chair of the Cajun professor at Trinity College were Paul Dirac, who came up with the relativistic theory of quantum mechanics, or one that uh, predicted anti antiparticles. And also uh, after him, Stephen Hawking, who died not too long ago. So it's a very prestigious position, and uh, you have to be quite good at what you do in order to hold it, and Newton was. Well, uh, Newton, uh, I just uh, made some uh, notes over here. Uh, he, um, he engaged in study, and he, wor he would work uh, by himself. He wasn't interested in, in women, at one time, he accused uh, Locke of trying to fix him up with, with some uh, yeah. women and got angry with him. He had no time for those things. He, he, might, he would work like 18 hours a day and 
uh, including weekends. Uh, he had his own private library of around 1,600 documents. Uh, one of them was the um, works the uh, of Descartes. And so there's this book, I'm showing it over here. It's the Philosophical Writings of Descartes. Uh, and I marked in the book the chapter on principles of philosophy that was uh, published, the Latin text was published in 1644. So Newton was two years old when Principles of Philosophy was published. And the significance of Principles of Philosophy is that it does physics, it has physics in it. And one of the things that uh, is in the Principles of Philosophy are laws that are very similar to the laws that you find in Newton's famous work, the Principia. And so let me show you the latest translation, as far as I know. Uh, it's the most recent translation, or called a new translation when it came out. Here it is. Uh, let's see if I can get it in, in, this is in the, the new window. new translation of Descartes' works, or uh, is this, are you showing? No, this is a, this is a new translation. This, of, this is the Principia. Yeah. I, now, I, uh, I Tom, it? Larry. So, so Newton. You see. Hold on a second. So Newton wrote Newton wrote the Principia in Latin. I assume is that right? And then has to be yeah, translated okay, into right. English. Okay, yeah. Is, that, is that correct? Yeah. He he wrote the uh, he wrote it in Latin, and this translation. And there has been more than one translation. This translation that I showed you is by I Bernard Cohen. Uh, he has the knowledge of the of physics and the history of science, and Anne Whitman, who is the Latin scholar. So she did the translation into English. And um, ab about- and Cohen, uh, also, Cohen also wrote a me? book on Benjamin Franklin's scientific thought. But I'm curious though, you, you mentioned Descartes, and I know that yes. uh, Newton read Descartes, but that his scientific methods really uh, so, so Descartes' scientific methods became, uh, you know, the, the most popular for a time, but that, that Newton's eventually supplanted them. So you could, you talk a little bit about that's right. Um, his early influences from Descartes and how he uh, eventually came to, to see Descartes' uh, method of, of doing science, so to speak. Well, he, he read, uh, Descartes, that was part of, part of his library. And he read it quite thoroughly because his laws are similar, but he has also criticized Descartes on uh, certain ideas about motion. Also, uh, Descartes' idea about vortices is uh, are the, what responsible for the planets going around the sun. That was quite different from Newton. Newton uh, Newton's idea was that there are active principles in nature and force is such an active principle. But I want to give you a, a little flavor of the, uh, the, some of the comparisons, but you're, you're quite right. Uh, Descartes, by the way, also didn't work out all the consequences uh, of the vortices and get the detailed numbers. Newton did. And I will show you the frontispiece of the first edition you see over here let's see can i get it how can i get it to uh i'm moving this way okay yeah yeah, yeah i okay. can see i can see it i can see it now yes okay it says yeah philosophia where my finger is over here uh, um, this this is this is the page Philosophia Naturalis Principia Mathematica. Now you notice the Principia Philosophia, Principia Philosophia. Uh, that was the title of the Descartes work, but in smaller type, you have Naturalis and Mathematica, and that's very important. So the Latin. Philosophia Naturalis Principia Mathematica. If you want to translate it into English, instead of reading from left to right, you read from right to left. You start with Mathematica. 
So it would be mathematical principles of natural philosophy. You get it? Instead of princ uh, principles of philosophy, it's mathematical principles of natural philosophy. And if you look at Newton's right. uh, book, it is filled with mathematical descriptions. Uh, he doesn't give you a whole bunch of equations, just, you know, like some people might do, you know, it's all equations. Uh, Newton has physics done the way I think physics should be done by explanations. You know, here's the way the, the world works, so to speak. Here are the way, here are the way things happen. And he, uh, he uh, wrote this, uh, the, uh, I will simply refer to it as the Principia. Uh, he wrote it at, in part, the urging of Edmund Halley, who was uh, a famous astronomer at the time and a friend of Newton's. Um, Newton was uh, very private, didn't display uh, his uh, works to the world, didn't like to get into controversy. He had, he had controversy with uh, Robert Hooke, uh, who was a uh, member of the Royal Society, um, but Newton tend to be secretive. However, how they kind of brought him out um, into the world uh, in the sense of, uh, for example, a famous story. Halley goes to Newton uh, one day and says, um, about this comet, uh, I was, uh, that ke seems to, reappear like every 75 years. Uh, do you have any idea what the orbit of that comet is? And Newton says, sure, it's an ellipse. And Halley said, what? How do you know that? And Newton says, because I calculated it. And uh, Halley says, well, can you show me the calculations? And so Newton looked, he couldn't find it. He says, don't worry about it. I'll send them to you. And he did. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Halley, Halley was amazed. Okay. And uh, Newton used geometry in the, at least in the Principia. Um, the way I teach Newton's gravity uh, in an upper level course on classical mechanics, I use calculus. Okay. Um, and I'll say a little bit about the calculus in a minute. But so Halley urged uh, Newton to, uh, to publish. And in fact, Halley financed some of the uh, publication course. And the, the Principia went through three different, uh, three, three editions, okay? Uh, one of the things, uh, there, were, there were three books to the Principia. The last book, book three, is called The System of the World. And one of the reasons Newton and his publishers uh, uh, put it to, uh, that way is because they thought that it would sell more. You know, it would capture the popular mind, which it probably did, uh, because he explains, uh, Newton explains such things as, you know, why the comets move as they do, about gravity, what is the effect of gravity on uh, the planets, the gravity from the sun on the planets. Now, for the people who don't uh, know much about science, uh, Newton has a, uh, a nice little illustration. Let me see if I can, if I can uh, pull it up over here. Um, While you're doing that, I, I just wanted to get in for yeah. some of our, our listeners. Uh, you, sure. you mentioned the title of the book here, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. And at this right. time, natural philosophy uh, encompassed what we today call science. And there were sort of two vying schools, I, I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but... Um, there was this, this sort of speculative natural philosophers like Descartes, who did this sort of armchair science, armchair physics. And this is how Descartes, as I understand it, come, came up with his, his vortice theory in, in which the entire universe is this sort of uh, vortex of whirling fluid. And other people like Thomas Burnett, for instance, came up with this idea that the, uh, you know, the, <clears throat> the earth was this shell and then it cracked and then the land fell into the water. And, and they didn't have any... They weren't going based off observations for the most part. They were just sort of making these conjectures. And then you had the, the, you know, the natural philosophers, the experimental natural philosophers. And it was, you know, it was Hooke and it was Newton and others. And, and John Locke later uh, really um, 
identified with this school. But so just the, the broader point here is just natural philosophy. That means science. That, that's what we today call science. And, and there are different opinions as to how to prosecute natural science. Uh, I, um, I think that Descartes uh, has done more than uh, one normally would expect. You know, so for example, he's done observation of, for example, of the rainbow. He's done uh, of his observation of the, oh, you see this? This is from Descartes. How can I move this over here? I don't know. Other way. I don't know which way. This way? Yeah, move the other, move the other. There you go. There you go. Yeah, there you go, Larry. Yeah, now we can okay, see. Okay, so let's see. I don't know what, where where you can see. Is it showing in my window? I, I If I move yeah, one yeah, way or can the you other. Can you just what, what that is? Raise, raise, raise it a little Can you see higher. the eye? You see the eye? You see yes, the eye yes, there's the no bottom? Yes, yes. Okay. So yes. and the rays that go into the eye. So so Descartes actually was a was a good observer, but he didn't have the mathematical skill that Newton did. So he couldn't actually uh, calculate and check his calculations. So in that respect, uh, he's more in the armchair than Newton. But he was also uh, a good observer, and I'm not talking now about. Uh, Descartes' cogito. I think there are problems with that. There, there are other, there are other problems with Descartes in in that uh, his argument to get to the cogito um, uses ideas that he's actually arguing against. So it's a problem. It's sort of, you might call it a. a um, he he, uh, it's kind of a stolen concept, as the term term goes. Uh, but uh, Descartes, I have a lot of respect for him uh, because he was uh, he was on the way. He, I was thinking that he's more like um, someone who has uh, created the uh, the solution, uh, so to speak, for the science for the discoveries, and Newton kind of dropped the the crystal in, which. Uh, which crystallized out all of these wonderful results uh, from the Principia in the, that's in the Principia. Uh, and let me, uh, let me jump in here for a second. Larry, sure, yeah. I just want to jump yeah. in for a second um, because I want to make sure that we get to, you know, the, the development of calculus and the dispute with Leibniz and all of that, you know, all okay. of that material, which is, you know, I think is, really really important newton's achievements are so vast i mean we could you know with, with calculus and the laws of motion and optics and you know i mean we could spend hours discussing him but we don't have that much time um so the development of calculus and, and of course with his his can i call him his uh, his rival uh gottfried leibniz i know i know there was a, dis a dispute between the two over the provenance of of calculus so so no, I know you're you're an expert on this. So, 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 how'd that happen? Well, um, I've read different things about the controversy, the controversies between Newton the man and Leibniz the man, and the controversy as continued by the Newtonians and the Leibnizians. Okay, I don't know which uh, created the greater uh, the greater force, but there was there was a controversy. Um, Newton's the uh, creation of the calculus and also uh, of the idea of gravity took place during the year 1665 and 1667 when uh, Cambridge University was closed because of the Black Plague. Okay, so Newton went uh, back to Woolsthorpe, the country where he was born, which these uh, Woolsthorpe these days uh, travel. It's about an hour from uh, Cambridge University. He went. Uh, he went there, and then he he speculated on certain things, and he discovered he discovered the uh, the calculus, which they he called the method of fluxions. Okay, and uh, also a gravity. Now. Something I should mention about um, gravity, because as I say, the calculus uh, was not used by Newton in the Principia. 
to describe uh, the uh, the motions, okay? Um, but uh, it's used typically these days when people teach about um, how the planets move. Um, I give you a simple example because this might help you as some of your readers about then uh, we can get back to more of your questions. Um, uh, people had the idea that uh, the heavenly bodies were in their own sphere, so to speak, or spheres. And they, uh, the objects occupied uh, or worked by different laws than uh, laws of things on earth. You drop a stone on earth, okay, it falls. That's one, one kind of motion. Uh, you see the moon going around the earth. That's a different kind of motion, uh, it, different kind of principles. So the story goes that Newton is sitting in the apple orchard and an apple falls. And he's looking at the apple falling and he's looking up in the moon. Story is probably ap apocryphal, but anyway. And he thinks, well, the apple's falling. Uh, what if the moon is a falling body? Well, how would you get to that kind of thing? So there's a picture of um, that Newton has in in this. Uh, let's see, where is it? Okay. Oh, here, here it is. I don't know if you you can see this, but this this is. Let's see. Can you see it? What? Wait. You hold it. Hold, pull the the other way. Um. Wait, I'm holding the other it. One, the I'm, other way. I'm not doing and yeah, there we it? go. There we go. Now, yes. Now okay, you see, see the, the, the earth? I don't know why I'm having such difficulty. Why does it keep moving hold down? A little, hold it a little higher. Hold it a little higher, Larry. And, you know. How's that? Okay. You can, okay, you see the earth and you see these these circles. And there's a mountain at the top. And, uh, and uh, right. there are these uh, curved lines that go from the mountain to the earth. And some of them go further. What the hell is going on? Some of them. Why does the camera keep moving around? That's okay. If you could, if you could describe it, because this is oh, going to be I going see. over a podcast. We're going to need to it's know. It's me. It's me. I understand how it works now. I wasn't holding it before my monitor. Okay, now you can see it. You see the Earth. Yes. Can you? See? Yes. Okay. Uh, and anyway, there are those there are those curved lines. So here's the idea Newton had: you you throw an object from the top of the mountain, it goes a little further, hits the earth, and you throw it harder, and it goes a little further, and it hits the earth. Now, if you throw it hard enough, it keeps trying to fall f toward the earth, but the earth curves away from it as it's falling. So if you throw it hard enough, it goes all the way around. It's a falling object. You see, it's attracted by the earth. And it's a falling object, though, that because it goes all the way around, it's now in orbit. So then the idea, well, what if the moon is like this uh, object that's thrown from the top of the mountain, so to speak, although the moon is not thrown from the top of the mountain. And uh, if that's the case, the key idea is that what pulls the moon around? Well, if it's like a stone top thrown from the top of a mountain, it's the Earth's gravity. So that had, of, of course, be worked out, and, and Newton worked it out, okay? And so one of the things he did besides discovering the calculus was discover the, the universal law of gravitation, and he names gravity, and I'll, I'll, I'll just quote from the Principia in uh, something uh, called uh, one of the scolium. He says, hitherto we have called centripetal that force by which celestial bodies are kept in their orbits. That is, centripetal means center seeking, or the moon tends to go toward the earth, but it keeps going around. It is now established that this force is gravity, and therefore we shall call it gravity from now on. Okay, so that's from the Principia. And um, did you did you want me to say anything about any of the other things he did? Because Newton was involved in, besides mathematics and uh, besides physics uh, and gravity, he was also involved in alchemy. You know that? Yeah, that's he, that's he, really interesting. 
That's, yeah, the, that's really uh, interesting. The I, I think and, jo- the, and the theology. Was John mentioning about the uh, finding some lead uh, in Newton's hair when the body was. Yeah, injured. he wanted to transmutate different metals into gold, right? And and yeah, right. I think at the time there wasn't a clear divide between science and alchemy the way that that we think there is today. In fact, a lot of people thought that this idea of gravity was this occult thing because here Newton is positing that something can act upon something else at a distance. And they thought, yes. well, in order for something to act on something, it has to be physically touching it. So even this idea of gravity was considered somewhat occult and, and maybe in the realm of the alchemical. Is that right? Yeah. A, a cult, though, it mean, meant something different than it means today. In Newton's time, it usually, it usually means hidden. Here, it, yeah. it has a mystical kind of thing. You like the occult forces, that kind of things. Uh, and mm-hmm. Newton himself was ne- was not quite satisfied with an instantaneous action at a distance, that there should be some sort of contact inter- interactions. But he says, well, the theory works, and, and it did very well. And what's, what's imp- uh, also very important that I should mention about the law of gravitation, it's not just called the law of gravitation. Newton connected heaven and earth, the falling of the stone and the falling of the moon. The moon is attracted to the earth. The earth then should be attracted to the sun. The planets are attracted to the sun. So Newton was able to explain Kepler's laws of planetary motion through his universal law of gravity and his laws of motion. If it happens close, close to home, so to speak, then stars can go around each other, and they do so by, uh, by the law of gravitation. So Newton's law of gravitation is called the universal law of gravitation for good reason. Okay, it and applies. There's a sense in which, in doing that, he actually united the work of Galileo and Kepler, right, and, and integrated them into one science of everything, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good way of uh, of, uh, of looking at Newton. What Newton uh, did, uh, he was a great integrator. Okay, uh, so people who uh, discovered this or that, Newton uh, put certain things together and uh, gave us a a more unified uh, picture of the world. Now he also worked with light. And he discovered that light is made up of colors, that white light. And he, he did this by using the prism. Now, Descartes also had have, have observed that, of course, you look at the rainbow and you see different colors. And the same principle by which the colors of the rainbow are produced are essentially the principles by which the colors of white light are separated by a prism. It's called refraction, okay? And, um, and there's also some reflection. And Newton uh, was the first to show, show the separation of the colors. And he investigated uh, colors uh, quite extensively, and he investigated optics. In fact, he was made a fellow of the, uh, he was invited to join the Royal Society because of his creation, his invention of what's called the reflecting telescope, which is about, it was about six inches long. And the principle uh, that Newton used to make this telescope was reflection. Why? Well, because if you had these great telescopes that they had at the time, uh, you have light going through glass, okay? And it comes in the one end of the telescope, goes through glass, and then it has to be focused so that the eye can see the distant object. However, because it's light that's going through glass, the colors are separated. And in the case of a telescope, it's a nuisance because the different colors focus at different places. So what Newton did by creating the reflecting telescope was basically get, at, get rid of the glass lens, and uh, that caused quite a stir uh, in the Royal Society. Uh, I don't yeah, want I to uh, talk. Um, you guys might have other questions. 
the oil yeah comments. i wanted to i wanted to get back to the calculus issue because i find it and i think a lot of people find it fascinating so correct me if i'm wrong larry so so newton in england and leibniz on the continent develop develop calculus independently and roughly concurrently uh, is 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 the notation of, of one or the other simpler or, or you know more readily accessible or more more effective um, yeah that's a good question smiling. and the answer is yes and, and in fact it's the Leibniz notation that uh, we use primarily today the d d something d something else uh, one over the other dx dt and uh, I should mention that I saw uh, some of Newton's manuscripts when I was at uh, Trinity College in Cam at Cambridge University. When um, I wrote, I wrote letters which helped uh, get um, uh, some of my students' scholarships to Oxford. And uh, and at the time, my university had enough money that they could send me over, so I got a free trip to Oxford. And um, uh, the guy, uh, one of the students, his girlfriend was studying at Cambridge. She got me rooms at Trinity College. And I went to the Wren Library at the time that I was, I was studying. I was, I was a Yale visiting fellow, so I was really interested in the history of science. And I told the person at the, the librarian at Wren Library, which is in Trinity College, he said, oh, I have to show you. She showed me Newton's death mask and then invited me back. The next day I came back and I was able to get one of the um, uh, documents that Newton wrote on the calculus. And he used uh, what we use today uh, when you write the derivative with respect to time. Uh, uh, so the derivative of x with respect to time is written by Newton as x dot. So he, he invented, you could say, the dot notation. So in that respect, we still use Newton's notation. But for the most part, in, and particularly in mathematics, we use Leibniz notation, d of x divided by d of t, you know, the derivative. Wow. Um, and and there, was this, there was this controversy, and it was a controversy over priority. It was the same kind of controversy uh, that uh, you had with, Ro with Robert Hooke and Newton. Uh, you know, so Hooke says, well, I gave Newton the idea of universal gravity. Okay, but there's a difference between someone suggesting an inverse square law, if he did, okay, an inverse square law, and someone who works out the consequences, okay. Hooke didn't, Newton did work out the consequences. Okay. Um, so you have these kinds of, you have uh, these kinds of uh, controversies, and, and it has to do with personalities. As I mentioned earlier, Newton hated controversy. At one time, he was refusing to publish um, uh, parts of the Principia, and, and uh, so you, you always have these personalities, you know. And uh, that's he part held of, off that's publishing part of his optics until Hook's death, right? He 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 didn't want to publish it until yeah, after right. Hook had died, and you know. Yeah. It's said that he lost his mind a couple of times. He had these sort of nervous breakdowns, but he was working himself, you know, what, 20 hours a day, 18 hours a day, just crazy amount of time and not eating well. And he had obviously been born with health issues. So some of this might have been par for the course. And maybe the speculation about the mercury poisoning is accurate to some degree. But at the end of the day, he invented what we know today as the scientific method, right? And this is Correct me if I'm wrong, but book two of the Principia is where he lays down several principles, I think four principles of how to conduct science as opposed to just speculate, uh, you know, speculation and conjecturing about how things work. And um, yeah, is it He's, uh, who we say today that systematized this? Let's see. Oh, well, mm -hmm. like in, in this is one of his books. Anyway, he sets down. Uh, probably more accurately than anyone else. Although there were people like Bacon who had, uh, uh, who had uh, ideas about how to proceed in the scientific me method, nature to be commanded must be obeyed, that kind of thing. Um, but Newton sets down definitions, what he means by the quantity of matter, what he means by the quantity of motion. Then he sets down axioms or laws of motion uh, the one that uh, people uh, can easily grasp is to every action there's equal and 
To every action, there is always opposed an equal reaction. So that's the English translation. And he gives uh, if an example of this. He gives examples. Newton gives examples uh, uh, when he sets down a law. So he says, if you press a stone with your finger, the finger is also pressed by the stone. And when I teach this, I have my students uh, put their thumb on the desk and press down. And I ask them, well, do you feel a kind of pressure on your thumb? Yes. Okay. Now press harder. Okay. So now they know they're pushing harder on the desk, but they also feel greater pressure on their thumb. So that's an easy way of specifying action and reaction. And that's one of Newton's uh, laws or motion or, or axioms. I hasten to add here that axiom here for Newton does not mean axiom in um, the objectivist philosophy, the axioms of philosophy, consciousness and existence, okay? Uh, and the axioms that are, that have to be, they're axioms in, in the objectivist sense, uh, Rand's point of view, is that they have to be used in any attempt to deny them, okay? So you, can, you, can, you can't deny your conscious without using, without being aware of something, right? Uh, so that so those are broader and uh, than the axioms that Newton has. In fact, without the broader axioms, you can't do anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't. If nothing exists, then nothing else, including the third law, can exist, right? Yeah. Right, and that takes so, us into the field. Of, that takes us into the field of philosophy, of course. And uh, Newton, it's it's fascinating to me because Newton. The, this brilliant scientist, rigorously rational, um, was also a devoutly religious uh, person. Yes, he? He, he did yes. a lot of work in theology, didn't he? Yeah, that's that's a really interesting uh, uh, issue in itself. In fact, right. um, I read somewhere that uh, he did more in more writings in alchemy and philosophy than he did in in physics. And a Newton famously, uh, but they didn't know it at the time, was an anti-Trinitarian, okay? So he could have been kicked out of his uh, post in Trinity College um, because uh, the church was the Church of England, okay? So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, that's a Trinity. Newton did not hold that. And he had to go down to make a special plea that he doesn't take, so to speak, the the Trinitarian vows. Uh, I don't think they were called vows at the time. Uh, and uh, he got he got dispensation. He didn't have to yeah, do that because he didn't believe. Theses. What thirty nine theses of the Church of England? He he got uh, dispensation from Charles the Second. And I think it was that he didn't think that Jesus was of the same uh, standing as God, right? He thought he was uh, right. made by God. Yeah. And so he wasn't that's God right. himself and he shouldn't be worshipped because that's idolatry. But yeah, there is this really interesting contradiction because here's the guy who invented the scientific method, but he thought that looking out at the, at the universe, this world of things that is so neat and organized, that that's proof. You know, this is, this is the uh, common... Uh, argument from design it's just it's it's such a um, such a, an ordered universe that it must be proof of design and you know exactly he did you can't expect that Newton would would uh, invent scientific method and live at a time uh, you know, when Christianity is is reigning and also you know, come up with some sort of uh, you know rational atheistic ethics that would be too much to ask right uh yeah i mean especially when the puritans, you as you, you, the puritans yeah, were in power when he was young right the puritans were in power when he was when he was a young man um and so you know they chop off your head if you if <laughs> if you disagree too loudly with that's why thomas hobbes one of one of newton's contemporaries who was a philosophic materialist and claimed everything is matter still professed christianity he, he had he he had to be an atheist if, he, if he's a consistent materialist, but historians think he professed Christianity because he wanted to keep his head attached to his shoulders. You know, so when, <laughs> when religion has that kind of cultural power, you know, uh, you might want to tone down your criticisms of it. But, but, but Newton, it seems like he was really devout. I mean, he was really a sincere, you know, sincerely devout yeah. Christian, whether he 
actually whether he actually subscribed to the Anglican creed or 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 he did. Did he, Larry? Did, did am I correct in remembering that Newton thought that space and time were the sense organs of God? Is that is that correct, or is that was that well, some just I, myth? God 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 pops up all over the place uh, in in so the, God, God's works. like that. You, you know. In huh? What? So God's like that. You know, he pops up all God's over like the place. That, yeah. <laughs> Well, in, in, in the optics, for example, when Newton, uh, in near the end of the book, book three, is speculating, he starts by saying, it seems probable to me that God, in the beginning, formed matter in solid, massy, hard, impenetrable, movable particles. Okay, so Newton had a genius for going from uh, the observable, the macro scale, down to the micro scale, and these are these are Newton's kind of primitive stuffs. Okay, he was wrong. Okay, and, uh, because we know that at the micro scale, it's not particles alone that come in, but there's a wave characteristic associated with particles. So the whole field of quantum mechanics, for example, um, involves this, but with what he had to work with uh he accomplished an amazing uh amazing amount uh, of science and the scientific method and uh he uh, spurred on the researches of other people like maxwell and einstein and there's a say saying he made newton made um if i've seen further than anyone before me is because I stood on the shoulders of giants. And N Newton was a giant to the people who followed him. Uh, there's something uh, I should mention about uh, Newton's work and from what I've heard, particularly like in some uh, objectivist circles, you know, that uh, his, his theories are, are, are correct, you know, given what he knew at the time. Strictly speaking, his theories are wrong, okay? Uh, they're, but they're very accurate to a certain level of measurement. Now, and what I mean by wrong is that if you want to get the correct second law of motion, it actually comes out of the special theory of relativity. And this, that law of motion that Einstein came up with in 1905, in the limit, when you're dealing with ordinary speeds, that speeds far below the speed of light, goes over to Newton's second law of motion, okay? Also, Newton's universal law of gravity isn't quite right, okay? What's correct is Einstein's general theory of relativity. And uh, some people just got a Nobel uh, for the discovery of gravitational waves predicted by the theory and uh, uh, discovered uh, as a result of the collision of two black holes, okay? So Newton's laws of motion have replaced by Einstein's, the Einstein law of motion is law of gravity by Einstein's general relativity. But why do we teach it? Why am I still teaching Newton's laws? Because they're bloody accurate and uh, very good in accounting for the ph phenomena that we're trying to describe for the most part, okay? so. I just wanted to make that distinction because I've I've heard these these right. other well, uh, points of view. Well, thank you, thank you for that, Larry, and and you're g giving John and I an idea that maybe maybe you'd be willing to come back in the future as a guest on the Hero Show to, to discuss Einstein and uh, Einstein's uh, uh, scientific achievements. That'd sure. Awesome. Um, can I read? Uh, do we have time for me to read a little quote? This is in the first edition. And it's by Edmund yeah, Halley. Yeah, it's ahead. about Newton. Um, so ahead. after this, the the <clears throat> particularly the the work on gravity, uh, Halley writes, and I just read some lines, not the whole thing. Uh, the first sentence is, "Lo, for your gaze, the pattern of the skies," and then skipping down, matters that vex the minds of ancient seers and for our learned doctors often led to loud and vain contention, now are seen in reason's light, the clouds of ignorance dispelled at last by science. And to end, 
Then ye who now on heavenly nectar fare, come celebrate with me in song the name of Newton to the muses dear, for he unlocked the hidden treasuries of truth. So richly through his mind had Phoebus cast the radiance of his own divinity. Nearer the gods no mortal may approach. That's it. <laughs> nice. That's, that, that's outstanding. Yeah, thank you for reading that, Larry. And you're right, we're, we're, we're running out of time. So I, want, I just wanted to uh, add something else here as a, as a kind of eulogy. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not a scientist. I'm, in, in college, yeah, I was an English major and, and literature has always been my first love. And, and um, it reminded me, you know, we're reading the, some of the heroic couplets when I was a college kid, some of the heroic couplets of Alexander Pope, you know, the great, the great poet of uh, of newton's day and and pope's yeah. couplet about yeah. newton is just stunning he's, he said he pope wrote quote nature and nature's laws lay hid in night god said let newton be and all was light unquote <laughs> I, I, I mean it's 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 rare when you get you know the uh, great poets of an era writing uh just singing the praises of the great scientists of the era and so I, I like I like that integration of of the humanities and the you know and the sciences and the the great the great poets recognizing the achievements of the you know of the great scientists and and who better you know to to sing the praises of in science than than Sir Isaac Newton. Well, Pope Pope uh, I wrote an a uh, very long work called an essay on man, which I which I love, and. Um, there, there are some lines in there which are reflective of New he, his, his life, Pope's life, Alexander Pope's life, partially overlapped with Newton's. So, go wondrous creature, mount where science guides, go measure earth, weigh air, and state the tides, instruct the planets in what orbs to run, correct old time, and regulate the sun. That's nice. Alexander Pope. It's an essay from the on man. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's beautiful. So, that is. We should add here at the end that these <laughs> people uh, people get grabbed by different should, uh, things. That grabs me. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Me too. Oh, what were you saying? I, I was just going to add here that the these scientific achievements didn't just help people understand. You know, it, it's awesome what he's he's captured in this couplet that nature and nature's laws. But then people were able to then use those and spearhead what became known as the as the age of reason and later the industrial revolution. And so without Newton's achievements, we wouldn't have the amazing technology, of course, that we have today. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's, it, that's a good point. In, yeah. in, in, in my book, The Capitalist Manifesto, I wrote a lot of, about the industrial revolution. And, and I'm, I'm certainly no expert in the science, but from what I understand, uh, James Watt's achievements with the, you know, perfecting the steam engine, the so-called, you know, the, the properly called work engine of the Industrial Revolution would not have been possible without, without Newton's advances in theoretical, theoretical science. At least, at least that's how a humanities guy like me, like me un, un, understands it. Larry, you want, you well, want the, I don't want to sound like Bill O'Reilly. Well, as, Riley, you, here, as you guys uh, were saying, on, on uh, his method, Newton's methods were very important because he focused very heavily on not just theory, like the armchair uh, aspect that uh, John was talking about, but also on prove it, you know, that, so that's, that's what you claim. Now let's see you demonstrate that what you claim is the case. The experimental method is, uh, is crucial. And Newton has pushed that uh, further, I think, than anyone before him, with a possible exception of uh, of Galileo, but I think probably even more than Galileo. I haven't studied Galileo enough uh, to make a firm distinction. But yeah, well, well gentlemen, I think we have uh, paid fitting tribute to the greatest scientist of uh, of history, and I want to thank Dr. Gould for coming on the show and. Uh, doing, doing a great job in explaining Newton. And like I said, I think John and I extended an invitation to you, uh, Larry, to come back on at some point in the future and, and, and do the same with, with Einstein and, and, and his achievements. 
and and uh, so I, any, anybody have any any last words before we before we sign off uh, the hero show for today uh, just I a post that you oh go ahead sorry go ahead. no 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 go ahead no no i was Good just guess, looking Larry. at the picture I, I was just looking next to the picture next to to andy which uh, relates to gravity Oh yeah, it sure the does. The takeoff of the rocket ship <laughs> by the great Brian Lawson, who, for my money, is today's you know the best painter of the you know of our day. Although I don't know enough about painting to make any definitive judgments, I just know what I like, and I like I like Brian Lawson's work uh, very much. John, maybe we should have Brian Lawson on at some point to, dis to discuss. Absolutely, painting. I'd have to second that. I love I love yeah. Brian's work. I just wanted to say Great. quickly, because this gets lost a lot. Um, Newton also was the master of the of the British mint, probably the most right. famous master mint ever had for the last 30 years of his life. And it was intended as this cush job where you just, you know, collect a paycheck and show up once in a while. But he took it extremely seriously. He he took justice seriously. He had himself made right. a justice of the, of the peace and all the different places in, in, in Britain. Then he disguised himself and visited bars and taverns and he conducted more than a hundred cross examinations and put like something close to 30 counterfeiters behind bars and had them prosecuted. Oh, so wow. I just thought this was a really fascinating episode that, that often goes uh, unnoticed because his other achievements, of course, overshadow it. But you know, he was uh, very interested in, in getting justice and understood the, uh, yeah, he understood some basics of, of economics and, uh, and, and didn't want to let these crimes go unpunished. So that's, I yeah, didn't so know that. that right? I mean, Isaac Newton, Isaac Newton at, in disguise as a criminal investigator, putting <laughs> yeah. bad guys away. He's like a forerunner of Sherlock Holmes, you know, except, except in yeah. the, you know, it, in real life, this is this is great stuff. We could go on and on with this forever, but I think we're just about out of time. So again, Larry, want to thank you very much for coming on. I'm going to salute uh, Isaac Newton and the uh, and the great scientists of history. And uh, I want to wish you all to, to have a, a very heroic day, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>